Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in History. This is Marcus Grodi, your co-host for this program, joined by Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. Afternoon, Hello, Marcus. Yeah. Afternoon, Monsignor. Yeah. We continue our study of Against Heresies. Thank you for joining us. Um, and what we'd like to do today is we're going to try and cover Book 4, Chapters 25 through 28. And so that's pages 382 through, through 95. And just a couple of points up front, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for those of you that are, are watching these long programs. I really appreciate it. In fact, in a moment, Monsignor is going to answer or address a question that we re received from one of our viewers. We really appreciate it. And uh, I would love to have more emails from some of you. Uh, if you have sent some and have not been responded, I've got to figure out where they're going to so that Monsignor and I can can look at those. Um, I, I want another couple points I wanted to just make as we begin, uh, because number two, we have to assume that if if you're with us on this series and, and you're listening, we're kind of assuming that you are reading the book on your own as we go along. Don't depend on, on our discussion to, to catch the beauty of Irenaeus. Right, Monsignor? I mean, you really have to yeah. read it on your own. Yeah, we presume. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, every professor that teaches a course assumes his students have read the texts, read the homework, as opposed to the cliff notes or, or whatever. But we really want to say that because that's part of it is we can't cover it all. We, we want to m move through these sections. Um, and then the, the other thing I want to comment, I had a chance to to watch myself for just about five, ten minutes of the last episode, and I was I felt a bit embarrassed by the <laughs> by the discussion with you, Monsignor. And and the reason is I was nervous that I might be perceived as coming across as if I'm some great uh, – expert in all this. And, and that's really not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because doing this program for a couple of reasons, one of which is if you've ever watched my Journey Home program, read any of our books, been involved with our work for all these years, helping non-Catholic Christians discover the church, it's the early church fathers that opens up so many people to the church. And for so many of us, and I fit in this category, those of us that are on the journey, we, we read snippets of the early church fathers and they awaken our heart to the church. But really, it, it wasn't until more recently that I had the chance to read this book for the first time. And so my excitement that I, I hope I convey in our class is because I'm, dis I'm finding in Irenaeus really neat stuff, some of which we Catholics take for granted that he didn't take for granted. And because of when he's writing at the end of the second century, it's at a time in history when the doctrines are, are fresh in a way of the apostolic deposit of faith and haven't encountered the great battles of the, you know, of the third and the fourth and the fifth centuries that in, in all that comes. So we're, we're, we're getting an early glimpse in my mind of, of this deposit of faith. And so, um, the reason I don't think Monsignor, you'd want to do the program all by yourself. That's not my gift. So I'm here kind of as the host to uh, uh, help us move through this great book. Uh, what we'd like to do today, as I said, we're going to go through chapters 25 through 28. And as usual, we're still we're stepping into a moving river Be, because he's in his long argument and we're just looking at snippets of it as we go along. So it's, it's hard to pick up a place without referring to what's been before because we're in the midst of this. But if we were to summarize, uh, I thought of two potential titles for this program. And maybe when we're all done, we'll decide which one is the actual title for this program, Monsignor. One title, which is the one that, that you suggested, and that is 
perfection through Scripture. Um, because all of this section is dealing with Scripture and the interpretation of Scripture and the faithful guarding and holding to the deposit of faith that we receive from Christ through his apostles. That's what this whole section's about. And who are faithful teachers? And he gives the example of a faithful teacher, right? In this. Another title that could be for this section is the church as the nurse. In other words, he talks about the church being the nurse of good, yeah. faithful presbyters. The church is the nurse of good, faithful presbyters. Those presbyters that are faithful in succession from the apostles holding to the deposit of faith, how do we make sure that the presbyters and those of us that are under their leadership are in line with the teaching of Christ? It's the church. The church as the nurse, and that's what he, he will call her. So we'll get to that. But we, before we jump into it then, Monsignor, we had a question from somebody, and uh, uh, pass it along to you to see if you want to address that. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Um, yes, uh, we had a question from Alan, and she asked a very uh, penetrating question about um, a text that we were we last looked at on page three hundred and sixty nine in our in our translation. Um, this is uh, Saint Irenaeus, uh, chapter twenty, section seven. And we talked about the way that. People interpret that expression, for the glory of God is a living man, and the life of man is to see God. And Ellen pushed us a little further, and she wanted us to speak a little bit about the sentence that follows. For if that revelation of God, which is by the creature, imparts life to all who live on the earth, much more that manifestation of the Father, which is by the word, imparts life to such as see God. Um, and so Ellen's question is, is simply, um, what is St. Irenaeus comparing Christ to here? Who is this creature? What is this creature? And I was thinking about that. I went yesterday and got the Latin text of this um, to, look at, to look at a little bit more at how the Latin works. And I found, I think, uh, probably a more a clearer translation in the Anti-Nicene Fathers um, series uh, that was done by you know the by those publishers in Edinburgh um, a little bit beyond the time of Keeble's translation, and I just want to read what um, what the what the Anti-Nicene Fathers edition says about this. I think it makes it clearer. For if the manifestation of God, which is made by means of the creation, affords life to all living in the earth, much more does that revelation of the Father, which comes through the word, give life to those who see God. And the way I think I'm reading this is that Irenaeus is talking He's drawing on a tradition now in the early church, the early Christian apologists all talked about this, that even if you don't have Christ, even if you don't have the scriptures, if you're just an ordinary thoughtful pagan, a Platonist say, you should be able to reach some conclusions about the world and its creator, that one God created the world. And I think I think Irenaeus is simply drawing on that. Um, uh, for instance, um, Justin Martyr, a few years before Irenaeus, maybe at the at the middle of the second century, he wrote to the emperor about this, uh, Antoninus Pius, and um, he spoke about how the created order gives evidence of the existence of the one true God who created it and brought it out of existence. And also we go to Theophilus of Antioch, 
who is writing about the same time, um, and and he he had a he's he had a wonderful point here about how the Greek philosophers had the right idea about the word creating the world. Um, so there is there is even in um, pagan philosoph pagan philosophy there is the ability to understand that there is one God. Yeah. Um, and I think Irenaeus is saying, okay, so even without the Old Testament scripture, and even if one didn't know Christ, there is still the ability for the mind to know something of God. But, but it's not nearly as much as what now comes to us because of Christ coming into the world um, and and making that revelation known to us. You're, you're, and I think that's how I read it. I, and I agree with you, Monsignor. Your, yeah. your answer reminds me of something that I said in the last program. And who knows, maybe uh, my, the way I said it might have caused confusion and maybe even led to her question. Yeah. But I remember saying that there's this long history that even led up into Vatican II that is expressed in Lumen Gentium 15 and 16. In Lumen Gentium 15, the reason I remember those pack because they those particular chapters so deal with our work. Lumen Gentium 14 talks about Catholics in the church, the necessity of Catholics remaining faithful to the church. Lumen Gentium 15 deals with non-Catholic Christians in their relationship with the church. And Lumen Gentium 16 deals with what about non-Christians. Jews and Muslims and, and and atheists, and that's why uh, I mentioned in last in relationship to this passage, and it reminds me, Monsignor, as you pointed out to me a couple of days ago, there was a reading in the office of second readings, the office of readings that came from Lumen Gentium chapter yes, uh -huh. two and sixteen, would deal with this very subject, and the reason it's pertinent for. For me, maybe more than you, Monsignor, is because I came from an evangelical tradition that was very suspicious of anything having the scent of natural theology. Yeah, yeah. There was a true rejection by a large portion of Protestant Christianity that rejects any idea of natural theology. And the reason was an emphasis on Scripture— and God's revelation, it's the only way to come to know Christ. You can't come to it by nat through natural theology. Well, the point is, Irenaeus is saying, I mean, you mentioned Justin and, and those, well, they all come from Revelation, oh, excuse me, from Romans chapter 1, verse 29. That's the foundation. Because mm -hmm. Paul writes, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. We have within us. That's right. As you pointed out last week, remember you talked about uh, because of their generation, you pointed out that script, that verse. That, yeah. that, that uh -huh. I forget where it was. It's because of their generation that um, they they understand these things. What does that mean? Because they were created in the image of God, and in that, as you said last week, image of God. A part of that is knowing the reality of God through creation, through as just your translation was really good on that. But that doesn't mean we don't need Christ or we don't need the revelation that comes through him. That's the point, is that in Christ, we get to know that that one God is one in three. Apart from creation, we'd never know that. And you know, Marcus, I just, since we were talking a little bit about St. Justin Martyr, um, he has very, he writing to the emperor and defending Christians' right to exist. And he, he points out that uh, you, you Greco-Romans, you know, you, you have no excuse about, um, about belief in, there should be a belief in one God because the, your philosophers proved it. And then he goes on 
in chapter 59 of um, the first apology to say that Plato plagiarized from Moses on this subject, <laughs> oh. <laughs> which is, I think he was just having fun with the emperor, but, um, but <laughs> it was a great point. Well, I remember in the, in the pages that are coming up, I, where he, he does mention Homer. You remember mm-hmm. that? At some place in the yeah. pages coming up, he mentions Homer. And I'm almost wondering, uh, it's on page 406, but they shall be accused by a prophet of their own, even Homer, by whom they yeah. were trained in such inventions. His words are, for he is hateful to me, even as the gates of hell, who hides one thing in his heart and utters nothing. So <laughs> there, there, Irenaeus on page 406 is getting into their philosophers and their background. But to me, this gets into this this really cool idea that um, that we recognize that in the creation there's the message of God, and why is that important to us? Because as missionaries, we can build on that. We can't leave it there. We can build on it. You know, Marcus, um, back in um, back in Oxford, Husey House, which. John Keeble, of course, was very much a part of that whole um, kind of effort to create the Husey House. Its motto is um, some is some words from I think Isaiah uh, Isaiah Deus Deus Scientiarum. God is the God of all knowledge, and that that is the our God is the God of all knowledge. Wherever it's found, wherever you find wisdom. He, he authored it. Well, in fact, I was, I was thinking, as you were saying that, that I know that we have non-Catholic Christians who, if they heard what we're saying, if they were listening, they, they might, they, some of them would find it appalling that, we, <laughs> you know, that we're, we seem to be implying that apart from Scripture, apart from Revelation, that you can know God. Or maybe they might hear us proclaiming an indifferentism, that it doesn't matter. But the the opposite is true, and and I want to say that we need to remember that if during these days we hear either the bishop of Rome or Catholic bishops or Catholic podcast people who might be waxing eloquently about our need to, to, to stand side by side with non-Christians in prayer and in action, uh, reaching out. And we might hear that and say, well, wait, well, what about our distinction about our faith? And this is not indifferentism. No. No, even that reading from the Office of Readings that you referenced, it ended with the expression preparation for the gospel. And so it's not that these other wisdoms, these other um, traditions are on an equal footing with Christianity. It's not that, but that they, in some sense, are a preparation for evangelization. This whole section that we're looking at, if I could summarize it from my reading, the simple way of seeing this whole thing comes down to the two ways, the two ways, which if I could summarize the entire Bible from Adam to Revelation, it's about the two ways, or Joshua getting ready to die. Remember that? As for me mm-hmm. and my house, he's talking about the two ways. Who are you going to follow? Moses to the people. Who are you going to follow? And that's what this is about. At the core of God planting in creation, everyone is without excuse. They know there's a creator. Who are you going to follow? Everyone that's ever lived has in their heart, in their the idea that there is a creator and we are his creatures. 
And as Monsignor, we said earlier that Irenaeus talks about that there was a natural precepts of the law that were from the beginning, long before it was written down, the patriarchs had it in their consciences, that they love the Lord their God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, their neighbor as yourself. That was there. It's planted in there. And so one on the one hand can say, yes, people outside of Christianity, outside the church, outside the sacraments, outside the apostolic, they can be saved because of these things. The church says that God's not tied to his sacraments. But on the other hand, we can't presume on that. Yeah. We can't presume that our good non-Catholic Christian brothers out there who love Jesus and are reading Scripture, that what they're believing and doing is salvific. That's where we're in danger. That's why we evangelize. That's why we call people to the fullness. And that's to me, that's what Irenaeus is doing in this whole section. How do we know a, a faithful presbyter or a bad presbyter? You know, people before Christianity, can they be saved? He's dealing with all these issues, and they all, through Scripture, bring us to Christ. They all bring us to Christ. The, in fact, there's one place in there, Monsignor, where he talks about pe people could read the Scriptures and miss the Incarnation, though it was always there. Yeah, yeah. But the only way they can see the Incarnation is through the cross. Then the stuff starts making sense. That's right. That's right. You know, there's, as I said, there's stuff in here we take for granted now, but it was it was fresh and new for Irenaeus. So, so Monsignor, let's go to then page 382, everyone. Okay. That's where we're going to begin today. And 382.1, that section, oh, excuse me, all of chapter 25 Sections 1, 2, and 3, it seems to me, focus primarily on the issue of Abraham being the father of all. And, and his argument is, is very fascinating, that if you look at salvation history— he divides it there on the bottom of that page as being <clears throat> uh, before, during, and after circumcision. Before, mm -hmm. during, and after circumcision. And that's kind of the whole Abrahamic experience. I... You know what I on that chapter uh, twenty twenty five. What the one that I highlighted was um, on page three eighty three. Yes, the beginning of section three, um, which speaks about how each dispensation in salvation history serves the purposes of the one true God. And if, perhaps I can just read that sentence, please. For it was meet that while something should be foretold in a fatherly way by the fathers, others should be typified in a legal way by the prophets. Others, again, should be fully traced after the delineation of Christ by those who have received adoption. But all are shown forth in one God. So the unity of salvation history is very clearly spelled out there. Yeah. Abraham was before himself, was before circumcision. He had faith um, in, in the, the fathers, the patriarchs had the faith before circumcision. Um, and that's what he's talking about here. And so he becomes the, the, all the sons of Abraham are those who through faith, whether circumcised or not, have their faith in Christ. And that's what we believe as Christians, you know, that that's why we believe that we are adopted sons of Abraham is through our faith in Christ. And there's the the context, it seems to me, here. Um, another thing, and so he summarizes at the very end there in the bottom of 383, thus the patriarchs and prophets sowed abroad the, the word concerning Christ, but the church reaped 
gathered the fruit. So all of this has come forward from the, yeah. from the fathers who taught in a fatherly way through the patriarchs who taught in a legal way. I mean, the prophets that taught in a legal way, all coming to Christ and his adopted children. One other thing I want to point out is section two, this story about the, the, the type of Judas's son's wife, Tamar, in, in that whole story. Um, he, for those of you reading, you know, you should read that. And what is interesting to remember in our translation has his brother, Ferris, but in regular translations, that's Perez. And where do we encounter Perez? Well, if you look at either of the genealogies in Matthew or Luke, Perez is in there. You know, in, in terms of the heritage uh -huh. of both Mary and Joseph are Perez. So what we're talking about here is the, is the remnant, the, that thread of God's people coming through Judah through his son's wife. Now, you know, you, you read this, it talks about the, the scarlet sign and the passion. But what I found fascinating this, to me, it, it emphasizes something that Irenaeus will get to later, and that is that we have to be careful to judge the lives of, of the old, the, of the ancients before mm -hmm. they had the law or the clarity of Christ. We have to be careful of, of judging the ancients. And the way it's he'll say in there that that what was written down about their lives is for our warning. But we have to be careful judging them, because we too have things in our past that we've probably not done very well, and by God's grace we've been forgiven, move on. But they didn't have all that back then. And the reason I bring that up is if you go back and read Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Genesis 38. We're not going to do it right now. But you read the whole story about Tamar? Irenaeus skipped an awful lot of that story that doesn't put Judah in a very good light. I'm going to have to read that again. I have. It's been a long time since I've done that chapter. Well, yeah. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically Tamar yeah. is his son's wife. And his son dies, and he promises Tamar that when his youngest son gets old, well, of course, there was Onan, was the first one that, his other son that went, that's a whole other story about, that, that kind of deals with our idea of uh, contraception, uh, goes back to the story about Onan, but then yeah. when he dies, uh -huh. then he's got a third son called Shelah, and he promises his son's wife that when that son gets old enough, he'll be able to give you children. Well, Judah doesn't do that. So one day Judah's out for a walk and he sees Tamar. He doesn't recognize her. He thinks he's a, she's a prostitute. So he decides, well, hey, I'm going to get this prostitute. So he ends up having intercourse with his daughter-in-law Because he thinks she's a prostitute, and he gives her some things as payment. And later she comes around and proves to him that her son, Perez, those two twins, are from him. But the reason I bring that up now, there's a lot in that story. Yeah. Genesis 38 is kind of tucked in the rest. You wonder why is it there? Well, because of Perez, that's why. But Irenaeus doesn't go into that. And I think it's because later he says, we aren't to judge the ancients on the same standards that later by grace we've come to recognize are the standards of God. They didn't have it written down back then. Right? Do you think... Marcus, do you think that maybe the medieval popes had a little bit of wisdom in saying that we should leave scriptures in Latin? <laughs> maybe. 
right. yeah. There were some stories in the Old Testament, yeah, that, that don't go oh. well from the pulpit. Yeah. Uh, but again, to me, there's an ex- just to me, that's an example of what he'll say later about that very thing is that we don't judge them for the standards that, that later became clearer because Jacob had some nasty parts of his life too. So anyway, monster. Uh, so there's a little overview of chapter 25. If you look at chapter 26 and 26 is, um, I, I, I showed you this not to make a big deal out of the fact that I've underlined so much, but there is so much in this there chapter, is some, isn't there, I've Monsignor? I've made a, a number of notes myself on it, yeah. Um, there is so much in this chapter that, how can you not, let me just begin reading section one. If a man, therefore, read the scriptures attentively, he will find in the same the word concerning Christ and the prefiguring of the new calling. For Christ is the treasure hid in the field, i.e. in this world, for the field is the world. And Christ in the scriptures is a hidden treasure because he was indicated by types and parables. Therefore, what relates to him as man could not be understood before the fulfillment of the predictions had arrived, which is the coming of the Lord. Now, Monsignor, there's a lot in just that little section. Yeah. Um, I would, you know, just to go down a, a few more sentences, I thought something that really jumped out at me, um, uh, just toward about two thirds of the way down the page, um, uh, when read by Christians, yep. it is a treasure hidden indeed in a field, but to them disclosed by Christ's cross and made plain, which also enriches the minds of men and sets forth the wisdom of God. His argument there is that the Old Testament means more to Christians than it does to Jews. We, I'm fascinated with that argument he's making there. But... Um, because in Judaism, it would be read from one dimension or perspective, but Christians see, see would see more deeply into it and see Christ prefigured in, in it all. That, that jumped out at me as... Yeah, this beginning, all of section one of chapter 26, in, uh, as we're looking at it, is about in my mind, seeing that the incarnation of Christ was always there in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until the cross that we were able to see it. And he says that. That's right. But, But to them disclosed by Christ's cross and made plain. The Jews didn't have that. They're looking at. They're just looking at the same words on a sentence on a page, and they don't see That's it. Right. So, in some sense, we don't stand in judgment of them. We've been given a lens that they haven't, and so therefore, to him who's given much, more is required. And we're going to get. Yeah, he keeps making that point now as we go through this. But, you know, to close off that first section on the top of page 385, we talked about this at the beginning. Yep. Um, Therefore, as we have shown, if a man read the scriptures, for so the Lord also discoursed unto his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. Um, then going down a little bit, he will be even a perfect disciple. So... You know, you mentioned that as a possible title for this podcast. Um, uh, to be a perfect disciple means that we have knowledge of the scriptures. It it almost seems like what he's saying in here is keep reading the scriptures. 
Mm-hmm. Keep reading the scriptures. Devote yourself to the scriptures and look at it through the lens of the cross. If you look at it through Christ's cross, then it puts everything in perspective and we understand. We understand Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac. It makes sense through the cross. You know, and that to me, that's his point. Christ is in the scriptures, he says. The other thing I want to point out also, you'll notice it, it when he's reco- you know, all of Irenaeus' argument are, are from scripture. And in this section, particularly, he does a lot of quotes from Daniel and Jeremiah. And to me, that tells me that Irenaeus is very. Uh, uh, recognizing the prophetic eschatological mm-hmm. fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets in the church. He's quoting Daniel and Jeremiah. And so he's he's recognizing we're in the last times that Daniel and Jeremiah were talking about. And we understand them as we recognize Christ through his cross. All right. Yeah, well, I was just saying, section two now on page 385, um, it's almost as if St. Irenaeus was making a prophecy about the apostolate of the coming home network. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, I see your whole life, what you've devoted your life to is summed up in section two here about how important it is to be in communion with the church. Well, pray um, thee, explain. Okay, yes. Yay, yay verily. Um, <laughs> let, let's just begin with that first, the first words of section two there. Wherefore, we should hearken to those presbyters who are in the church, those who have their succession from the apostles, as we have pointed out, who with their succession in the episcopate received, received a sure gift of the truth They received a sure gift of the truth, Marcus, at the good pleasure of the Father. But the rest, who withdraw from the primitive succession and gather in any place whatever, we must hold in suspicion, either as heretics and evil-minded, or as making division and lifted up and pleasing themselves, or again as hypocrites, so behaving for gain and, and vainglory's sake. All of these have fallen from the truth. There he gives us an example of schismatics, heretics, and um, and the and then the the priests or the clergy that are immoral. Yeah, um, it's, it just blew me away when I came across that this morning. And um, as we're reading this, so again in the so, context of Irenaeus many of the Gnostic teachers that he is pointing out their flaws were presbyters and presbyters with churches. Um, Even one of them, I think it was Marcion and one of those, is at Rome and has a following in Rome. And so part of the issue is you have laity or others that are wondering, who do I follow? Who do I follow? And that's what he's going to get into in the rest of Mm -hmm. this whole chapter. Good presbyters and bad presbyters. And what do you do with a good or a bad presbyter? And the bottom line is that it has to do with guarding, preserving, being loyal to living your life under the apostolic teaching that was received from Christ to his apostles and is being preserved in the church. And I know in the past on this program, I, I've made that distinction that, that the authority of the church gains is built upon the fact that it's preserving the apostolic teaching. But as you've pointed out in our discussions, Monsignor, to Irenaeus, there's no, there's no division there. 
Right. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have. It wouldn't have happened yet the way it has. So yeah, that's a good point. He he blessedly lived in a time when um, the church was was reasonably united. At least the the church that was recognizable as the church. Yeah. The, when he says yeah. those who have their succession from the apostles. The at the time he's writing, the idea of apostolic succession was not so much yet focused on what ordination does. Right. It it, it had more to do with loyalty to the deposit of faith. It would seem Though to I me. I think we're gonna as we go forward, there is one passage I think we're gonna see where he does speak about the effect. Effective Good. coordination. See, and that yeah, and that but, will be something that will develop. But I'm, I'm not saying it's there, yeah. not there yet. But we don't hear it. Yeah. So the, it's kind of like liturgy. Yeah. You don't hear much talk about liturgy. Well, does that mean they didn't have it, or because they just didn't talk about it? And I think it's more to the latter. We know from Justin Martyr there was liturgy at the time. Mm -hmm. We know that, but we mm -hmm. just don't hear talk about it because it's assumed and. Uh, so, but faith, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I just, I mean, the, th the other thing, you know, here is he's basically calling us in section two um, of our obligation to withdraw from schismatics and heretics and, and also to avoid bad priests um, because of their actions. They've, they've separated from the apostolic succession. Yeah. So he puts an, he puts a, it's a call to people to, dare I say it, to come into communion, yeah. to remain in communion. Well, the next paragraph, and as for the heretics offering as they do strange fire at the altar of God, i.e. strange doctrines, they shall be burned up by fire from heaven as Nadab and Abihu, but such as rise up against the truth and stir up others to oppose the church of God, remain in the lower regions, swallowed by an eddy of the earth, as Korah and Dathan and Abiron and their party, and such as rend and part in sunder the unity of the church, receive from God the same punishment as Jeroboam. Now, why Jeroboam? People might, well, what's Jeroboam? Who's Jeroboam? What's that got? Jeroboam? which we're actually going to see in a little bit, when Solomon, when Solomon fell from grace because his heart was turned to pagan worship by his wives, God responded by dividing Israel into the two separate kingdoms, northern and southern. And one of the kingdoms with Judah, led by a son of David called Rehoboam, but the other kingdom, Israel, was led by a non-son of David, whose name was Jeroboam. And, you know, on the surface, he's talking about division of the church. Mm -hmm. Division of the church. Now, again, at this point in time, it has to do with uh, faithfulness to the apostolic succession. He's not dealing with scandals in the church and things like that. That's not part of the discussion at this point. He's talking about faithfulness to the deposit of faith. But but Marcus, if you go over to page 386 on section 4. Yes. He does sort of speak about, he does seem to speak about um, calling out those priests that are unfaithful. Okay. Um, from all such, then, we must withdraw and cleave to those who both guard, as we said before, the doctrine of the apostles, and with their order as presbyters, exhibit sound speech and conversation without offense for the confirmation and reproof of the rest. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that speaks, you know, we don't, do we have an obligation to stay faithful to a bad priest? Yeah, this opens a big issue because it isn't yeah. just bad priest, but bad bishop. Yeah, exactly, because he uses those two words interchangeably here. Much right, of the way. and yeah. uh, you're more of a, you know far more about the time period than I do, Monsignor. I know that in the next century, in the third century, and then in the fourth century, 
we're going to have the rise of more and more unfaithful bishops. And they're going to divide in 325 mm -hmm. after Nicaea. There'll be bishops that will never speak to one another again, who's, who won't, won't fellowship with other bishops. And then we have the Donatists, and in that whole issue, we have the it, it, during Jerome when he says the church woke up and found itself Arian because the majority of bishops seem to be Arian. How do you know whether to follow a bishop or not? And in all those cases, we're not talking about scandalous living; we're talking about doctrinal issues in the application of the apostolic faith. Now, my personal view is the, the devil, what the devil used is got them tempted and they fell and got caught up in arguing over words, even though Jesus and Paul and Irenaeus says, the guys don't get caught up arguing over words, you'll, you'll lose charity. And that's what happened. And the devil laughed. And so we had these people arguing over things that and it divided the church over and over and over again. I mean, going forward, you know, in the in the in the early fifth century, uh, when when Saint John Chrysostom, well, I guess it would be late fourth, early fifth century, when he was transferred to Constantinople, his priests wouldn't accept him, partly because he didn't give good dinner parties. <laughs> he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't worldly the way they had now become accustomed to be worldly. And so for faithful Christians in that church, they had to make decisions about whether they were going to be faithful to these um, worldly priests or to their godly bishop. And we had um, godly bishops who were exiled because they took the stand on truth. Yeah. Even during the time of Constantine. You oh, know, yes. Uh -huh. You know, so... But, but Irenaeus is before that. And that's why I think Irenaeus is setting down standards for the church to follow. The question mm -hmm. is, did we follow it very well? And I don't think we did. No, yeah, I agree with you. You know, and, and to me, that's what yeah. he's saying here. Who's it? And sometimes, again, my also view is that sometimes in the divisions that happen in the church, the Holy Spirit is often awakening the church to its truth that it's either forgotten or taken for granted. I mean, if you want to have a good spin to the Protestant Reformation, to a certain extent, Luther's reminder that it's about faith is reiterating things that Irenaeus is saying all along in here about Abraham being the father of faith, but it's not a faith only rejecting faithful living was where it went too mm -hmm. far the other way. But it was a reminder of people whose lives had gotten too caught up in works to remember at the core of this is faith in Christ. Well, mm -hmm. in the, the time, what we're talking about now in this idea of separating yourself from bad priests right? Separating right. yourself. Well, that was one of the key doctrines of the Anabaptists during... R right now, where I live in Ohio, that's why right up north of me, I got a bunch of people that, that only drive around in carriages called, An called uh, Amish. And one of the reasons that even the Amish broke away from the other reformers was this issue of shunning do you remain in fellowship with a person? Yeah. And that was an issue in the history of the church. It was always an issue. Do you stay in, do you, what do you do with bad priests, bad bishops? Do you, do you say it doesn't matter and, and you just kind of go on in fellowship or you just say, I'm sorry, I can't be in fellowship with you because of where you stand. And that became a big issue in, in the next thousand years or so of the church. Um, as you and said, it, for us, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm just saying, it remains a very big issue today. A monster issue, actually. <laughs> well, Think about it. <laughs> yeah. Now we the other yeah. way way yeah. around. It's as if, 
as if to God, we, we believe it as if in the eyes of God, it really doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. yeah. It really doesn't matter anymore. You just don't talk about faith. You don't talk about politics. You don't talk about whatever, because it really doesn't matter. Is that real charity? Is that real charity? Irenaeus was saying, you know, if a man is wrong, you point it out to him. That's charity. You do it in charity, speaking mm -hmm. the truth in love. But to just let them be, because he talks about very clearly that those in, in, uh, in back in section three, but those who are contented indeed by many as presbyters yet are slaves to their own pleasures and prefer not the fear of God in their hearts, but harass others with reproaches and are elated with the pomp of that original grant and do ill in secret and say, no man seeth us, will be rebuked by the word who judges not by fair shoe, nor looks to the countenance, but upon the heart. So in other words, they'll stand before God for their schisms, heresies, divisions, and misrepresenting of the truth. He's really strong on that, isn't he, Monsignor? I mean, very, yeah. very strong. And then in section four, when he moves on after that, he gives the example of Moses and then Samuel and then Paul. He gives them as three examples of, of faithful, if you will, presbyters who had good consciences. That's the point there. Moses, yeah. Samuel, Paul. They weren't perfect in every way, but in their hearts, in their repentance, would turn to God to have a good conscience. It reminds me of First Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, excuse me, um, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence, and keep your conscience clear, so that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Right, Monsignor? you, you got to know your faith, you know the deposit, you guard it, you live it, and you keep your conscience clear so when you take a stand for what's true, people don't can't cut off and just say, you're a complete hypocrite. And sadly, we live at a time when the church yeah. is suffering for, in, for all this talk. In section, in section 5 on page 387, we come up with that expression that you suggested might be a title for our podcast today. Yep. Um, such presbyters, the church is the nurse. Yeah. How do you, how would you explain, how do you describe that? Um, how does the church nurse? Well, he, he does, he goes to prove it, which I love Irenaeus. He, mm -hmm. and how does he think about it? You know, he pulls out of Isaiah. I will give thee pr thy princes in peace and thy bishops in righteousness. I will give thy princes in peace, and thy bishops in righteousness, whom also the Lord saith, who then will be a faithful steward, good and wise, whom the Lord will set over his house, so to give them portions of meat and season. Blessed is that sermon, who the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so good. To me, that deals with the idea that the Lord, through his church, gives us the good presbyters. That's, I agree. And that next paragraph, he, he you know, asks the question, basically, where do we find these good shepherds? Sounds like he's talking about the church here. Why, um, don't, why don't we close our episode today with that paragraph, Monsignor? Why don't you go ahead and read it? Because it's okay. really important, it seems to me. Now, where one may find such, Paul teaches, saying, God hath set in his church first apostles, then prophets, thirdly teachers, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 there. Then where the Lord's free gifts are set, there we must learn the truth. With those who have the church succession from the apostles and what makes up a sound and irreproachable conversation, 
and purity and incorruption of discourse is known to abide. I'm going to read one more sentence then. Okay. For those both guard that faith of ours, the object of which is one God who made all things, and increase that love which points to the Son of God who hath done so great work of providence for us, and expound to us the scriptures without any danger, neither blaspheming God nor dishonoring patriarchs, nor despising prophets. Yeah, that paragraph sums it. There's so much in there, and I, again, I try and look at that through the lens of before I was a Catholic and back when I was a Protestant minister. He really emphasizes the importance of the church, and he uses the scriptures to defend this. Mm -hmm. That is, through the church, he has nursed these presbyters, We've received as a free gift the truth, and it's through the church that we learn the truth, he says. There we must learn the truth. With those who have the church succession from the apostles, uh, again, remembering what he said before, the union with the church in Rome, which is built on the apostles Paul and Peter. Mm -hmm. he That's says, right. We all must be in three, union. 331. Three, and. And what makes up a sound and irreproachable conversation, purity and corruption of discourse is known to abide. I love that because, in other words, it implies that when the when we're sitting around in the church touching these things, there's charity. It's not let happen what's going to happen later when we have the divisions, you know, and break down. Purity and corruption of discourse. For those both guard that faith of ours, guard that faith, the old, the object of which is one God. Then he gets into the Trinity. But one other thing, he, I, I like what he says, and expound to us the scriptures without any danger. That's where you're going to know whether you're interpreting scripture correctly or going off on what the Gnostics did. It's in the church. You know, that's how you'll know what is true. Monsignor, I was thinking we'd pause there and pick okay. up on chapter seven, uh, 27 next week because we big, begin a big section where, after all that he said, good and bad presbyters in the church, then it's like he, he says, well, I happen to know one of those good presbyters. And let's listen to some things he had to say. That's what we're going to look at in the next four or five and chapters. That, that's right. And then he talks about... Um, how God will hold us to a higher standard because we we come after the cross. And so those, there's some very sobering passages in here about the obligation of, of um, Christians to be true um, and the terrible consequences of faithlessness at this point. Monsignor, could you close us with prayer? And we'll pick up from there I, next I, week. I will. And what I'd like to do, Marcus, if I, if you don't mind, is to close with, um, close with the prayer for uh, today. You know, we're celebrating the feast of Saint Agnes. Yeah. And and I just want to tell everybody, um, Agnes means a lot to me long before I ever knew who Saint Agnes was, a martyr, a twelve-year-old martyr. <laughs> At the beginning of the fourth century, my first patristics teacher was Sister Agnes Cunningham, <laughs> and she she taught for many years at St. Mary of the Lake Seminary in Mundelein, Illinois. And um, it was Sister Agnes that kind of slowly woke me up to the need to um, come to the church. Hmm. And I just I she was the most wonderful teacher. She taught me the love of the fathers. And um, I would just like to um, remember her. And, um, and also St. Agnes, the martyr, this glorious witness, a 12 year old yeah. girl. Um, so I'll close with that prayer. All right. In the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. Amen. Al Almighty ever living God, you chose what is weak in the world to shame what is strong. Grant us then, as we celebrate the martyrdom of St. Agnes, that we may follow her example of steadfastness and faith 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. And thank all of you for joining us on this episode of Deep in History. We look forward to joining you next week. We'll pick up on that next chapter. I said we were going to do it this week, but we'll we'll pick it up next week. All right, Monsignor. Thank you for joining us. God bless me. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you all.